Now, often in the analysis of clinical trials, we're interested in some measure of effect that is often either a relative risk, some risk reduction, or another measure. And this class is really not intended to get into the nuances of clinical trials, but suffice it to say, there are numerous measures that can be calculated from a clinical trial. But the overall goal is to establish or demonstrate the efficacy of some new intervention compared to either the standard or a placebo. And that's often performed by measuring some relative or absolute difference between the groups of, of assignment. Another measure that is often generated from the results of a clinical trial is called the number needed to treat. And this is a quantity that's often used by clinicians as a means by which to determine or predict the number of patients who would need to be treated with this new intervention or exposure to either prevent one adverse event occurring, or it could also be flipped on the other side to, to say how many would need to be treated to, to observe one positive outcome. Now, similar to the way we calculate a relative risk in our previous lectures, relative risk can be, can, can be calculated in a, in a simple two-by-two two fashion using data from a clinical trial. And really, the only difference in this two-by-two two table now is that the rows represent the the assigned experimental arms rather than the exposure groups that were observed. But the risks and the relative measure are calculated the same as we have done in the past. And depending on the follow-up of subjects enrolled in the trial, the denominator value could be either person time or persons. So a very simple example given here to describe a study that was conducted to evaluate the efficacy of a new treatment for the common cold. This trial enrolled a thousand children who were newly diagnosed with a viral cold. 500 were randomly assigned to the new antiviral therapy and 500 were assigned to a control group. After five days, 200 of the study group had no cold symptoms. And the study group here is the new antiviral therapy group. And in contrast, 100 of the control group had no cold symptoms. So to, the question is, what is the relative risk of curing the common cold for the study group compared to the control group? And it's a simply the measure of the, of the ratio of the risks. In this case, we're not really thinking about risk, but we're looking at cure rates. So it's essentially the ratio of cures so in the numerator, we would have 200 over 500, or two-fifths, and the denominators, we would have 100 over 500, or one-fifth. And that generates a relative measure of two, which could be interpreted as saying children with colds who took this antiviral medication were two times more likely to be asymptomatic after five days compared to those who did not. We could also calculate what's called the risk reduction, which is essentially the difference in the risks between the treatment arms divided by the risk in the control. For another example, this was a study to evaluate the efficacy of a new vaccine for the prevention of a viral respiratory disease. 1,000 healthcare workers who, vol were, who volunteered to work with viral disease patients were recruited across different hospitals. 500 were given this new vaccine, and 500 were given a placebo vaccine. And after one month, researchers noted that 25 of the vaccinated workers had acquired this re viral respiratory disease compared to 100 who had received the placebo vaccine. And so you're asked to calculate the efficacy of this new vaccine. And in this instance, we may be interested in calculating that relative risk reduction and so here, when we throw in the numbers, we get a relative risk reduction of 0.75 or 75%. And the way that is then interpreted is 75% of viral risk, excuse me, viral respiratory disease infections can be reduced with this new vaccine compared to a placebo vaccine. And that's a fairly large number of reduction. Finally, discuss the number needed to treat measure. This is basically one over the risk difference or the cure rates between the treatment arms in the clinical trial. 
So here's an example. In a study to evaluate the effectiveness of a supervised diet and exercise routine to prevent the development of obesity in overweight children, 3,000 children were randomized, 1,500 were randomized to a diet and exercise plan, while 1,500 were randomized to some normal uh, pediatric care and recommendations, so the latter being just the standard of care. And after one year's time, 375 of the standard care children developed obesity, while 325 of the new intervention group were obese. So you can calculate the number needed to treat as one over the difference in the risks of obesity between the two treatment arms. And you end up with a value of 33. And the way that is to be interpreted is as saying that we would need to treat at least 33 overweight children with this novel diet and exercise plan to prevent one from becoming obese compared to having them receive just the normal uh, standard of care. And again, this measure is typically uh, one used by clinicians as it provides them with a quantitative value that they can then utilize in their uh, clinical practice. Now, there are many analytical considerations when it comes to the analysis of clinical trials. And again, this is not a course on clinical trials. Uh, but essentially, we typically calculate a measure of effect in the clinical trial, and then we, per we calculate some level of confidence around that measure of effect, usually. Uh, we have to consider whether or not we're interested in, say, incidence versus um, the cumulative incidence. We've talked about that before. There's always a need to account for data that are missing in the analysis of a clinical trial. Frankly, that is an issue that exists across all types of studies. And then oftentimes in the analysis and presentation of results from clinical trials, researchers will present more than one measure of association. And that's largely just because there are often multiple endpoints in clinical trials, and those endpoints require different uh, measures of association for interpretation purposes.